Uh, we're going back to the study of the minor prophets. And last week we kind of took a little break from that. Uh, but we're going to be in the prophet Nahum. 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 Uh, if you have your Bibles and you want to find that, one thing when you, when you talk about the minor prophets, you have to look real hard because some of them are so small that uh, you can pass them up. It's like, you know, if you blink, you miss it. Uh, Nahum is just only three chapters. And uh, he prophesied probably during about the time of Hezekiah, which would be make him concurrent with like uh, Isaiah and uh, Micah. And at that time, and if you turn to the prophet name, the very first line in the prophecy is this. The burden of what? Nineveh. Nineveh. How many people remember Nineveh? Now, who can tell me who, who the last prophet was that talked about Nineveh? Hmm? Is it? Jonah. Remember Jonah? Okay. Remember Jonah. Jonah, remember, he was the hateful prophet. He was the one that hated the Ninevites. He didn't want to see God deliver him. God told Jonah to go to Nineveh and preach to them. And Jonah said, you know, if I go there and preach to them, they might believe and have a revival and get saved. I don't want that to happen. So he got in a boat and started going the other direction. He didn't want to see the Ninevites saved. He prophesied against them, as a matter of fact. He said, well, you know, I can't do that. And we all know what happened, that God, you know, prepared a great fish and a storm, and Jonah ended up going to Nineveh, and he preached, he prophesied to them, and sure enough, they heard the word. They believed that the leader of Nineveh, the king, that was the capital of the nation of Assyria, if you look at the map today, in the very, it would be in like the northern part of Iraq. Uh, the king of uh, Nineveh said, repent, sackcloth and ashes, they call a three-day fast. I mean, even the animals fasted. They said, we're all fast, we're all taking part in this. And they, had a, they repented and they had a revival. God was going to destroy the city. And they repented and God said, I'm going to stay in my hand. And Jonah, we know when you read his prophecy, he was so upset. Because he, he said, I knew you were going to do this. If you read Jonah, we read it before. He said, Lord, he said, God, I knew you were going to do this. That's why I didn't want to come. And God basically said, Jonah, I'm going to have mercy on who I have mercy. And I'm going to save who I'll save. And uh, basically it was a lesson. And we, we talked about that lesson. You know, we can't decide who gets saved and who doesn't. We just got to be obedient to the Lord. God might send you to somebody that you don't like. And, and he might send you to some, matter of fact, he might send you to somebody that you hate. And not that anybody here hates anybody. I hope not. But he might send you to, to somebody. He sent Paul to the Gentiles. And when Paul was a Pharisee, he hated the Gentiles. He didn't have nothing to do with them. They were unclean. He wouldn't go into a Gentile's house. He wouldn't, if he brushed up against them, he'd have to go and wash and bathe. I mean, he, that's, that's just the way they were, you know. But that's who God sent to the Gentiles. He sent Paul. He might send you to somebody that you don't even like. And if he does, don't resist because if, he, if you do, he'll put you in a big fish and help you go there anyhow. But anyway, Nahum uh, was about 100 to 150 years after Jonah. Okay, And Nahum's message was a little different. In fact, when Nahum brought this message about the burden of Nineveh. He didn't really bring it to Nineveh, but he brought it to the people of Israel. He brought it to, the, to, to, the, uh, to Jerusalem, to the nation of Judah. Because by this time, the revival that the Ninevites experienced had worn off. How many people know that revivals wear off? You know, you know, we hear about revivals, and we'll say, oh, there was a, a great revival in Wales, and there was a great revival in, you know, the Great Awakening in America, and great, you know, throughout history there have been great revivals. In the Old Testament, uh, the last good king of Jerusalem was a, a king named Josiah. Josiah. I think Chuck's grandson is named after him, Dan, Danny Ecker's son, Josiah. Josiah was the last good king of of Israel, and when he came into power, or of Jerusalem, and when he came into power, 
you know, the, the place was in shambles because of all the idolatry and things that had taken place. So he, like, got everything straightened out, man. He, he cleaned the temple up. He tore down all the idolatrous uh, statues and the idols that they had worshipped. And he just did everything to get things right. He repaired the, the, uh, the, 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 the temple of uh, Yahweh, of Jehovah. He uh, reinstated the Passover. They had, a, they had, a, they, they had let that go uh, aside. And he reinstated the Passover. And he did all these things. And, man, uh, you know, Jerusalem was on fire for the Lord again it was a great revival and people were just worshiping God and Josiah died and when Josiah died it didn't take him long to go right down again see it was it was kind of like a superficial revival it was just a revival you know because they had a guy who who was in charge but once he died it lets me know that sometimes when there's a revival and people get all like fired up most of it is just on the outside it's just on the surface there are those who get saved. There are those who genuinely get filled with the Holy Spirit and, and God does a great thing. But most folks that get caught up in revival, it's just kind of like on the surface. How many know what I'm talking about? We've had them in the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Revivals that really started out as a move of God, I believe, but ended up becoming, becoming a thing. Anyway, that's not what this message is about tonight, but <laughs> it's about 100 or 150 years after Jonah that, that Nahum prophesied. And, and, and the good things that happened from the preaching of Jonah had over a hundred years had waned, had dried up, had flown, flown away. So now God is speaking the burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkishite. He starts by saying God is jealous. You know God is a jealous God? And when we think of that term jealousy, that, that kind of evokes a negative thing in our mind. Jealous, you shouldn't be jealous. But I want, to be, I want God to be jealous for me. I'm jealous for my wife, and I want her to be jealous for me. You know, I don't want nobody, I mean, she's my, I, I'm not sharing her with anybody. And she, I don't think she wants to share me with anybody. I hope not. I know, I know she doesn't. We're jealous for each other. That's a good jealousy. That's a good thing. Don't mess with my wife, you know. And some of you men feel the same way. You know, don't, you know, don't come. I mean, if you were somewhere and somebody come up and talk, start talking to your wife, you'd step up and say, excuse me. <laughs> you know, that's my wife. That's the way God feels. God's jealous. He wants us for himself. He doesn't want to share time with other idols or other gods or other things. He wants us. He's jealous. And I found out, personally, when I start... Flirting with the things of the world, God finds a way to get my attention. He seems to find a way to get me back in line with where he wants me to be. You know. God is jealous, and the Lord revenges. The Lord revenges and is furious. God furious, but he's love, isn't he? I've said this so many times before. We mistake when we hear the word love. We, we really don't fully understand it. I think the best way to understand it is to look at yourself. If you love somebody, there's some things that make you mad. There's some things that make you mad. When you see your kids doing stuff that you know they shouldn't be doing, and you've told them not to do it, and they're not listening, doesn't that make you furious? Makes you feel like you want to throw a brick at them. You know, you love them. You don't want to hurt them, but you want to, you know, you want to grab them and shake them and say, hey. God is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserves wrath for his enemies. I mean, this is the God that we worship. This is the God that we serve. He's a God of love. He so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son. But he is angry. It says in Psalm 5, I believe, he hates the workers of iniquity. He loved us. When I was a worker of iniquity, he hated me as to what I was, but he offered me a, a, an opportunity for salvation through faith in his son. That's how he expresses love to me. But in our sin, it's a whole different story. Now listen to what he said. We're going to read a little bit tonight and just uh, touch on a few things. It says in verse 3, The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and will not at all acquit the wicked. He's slow to anger. 150 years ago, he told the Ninevites, got them saved, and it's been 150 years. He's been dealing with the nation of Israel now for thousands of years. How long did he deal with you? 
I thank God he's slow to anger. I, I, wonder, I wonder when, he's, when his, his, his mercy toward the United States is going to end. I wonder, when his, I wonder when his judgment is going to be poured out. See, the things we're seeing today, you know, just recently, I don't know if some of you saw those pictures of those, those trailers flying around in that tornado. Wind and rain, there's not a whole wind and water, there's not a whole lot you can do to stop them. But we haven't seen his judgment yet. That's a picture. Maybe that's just a glimpse. Maybe that's just a taste. Maybe, but it's not, you know, when God sends his judgment, all that stuff is that stuff is just like localized and, and temporary. When God sends his judgment, when you read like the Revelation, you see when God begins to pour out his wrath, it's going to be a lot worse than that. I thank God he's long-suffering. I thank God he let me go for 29 years before I got saved without snuffing me out. He could have. and he would have, he would have been justified in doing so. The things I had said and done. But he was merciful. He's, merc- he's a long-suffering God. He's slow to anger, but that doesn't mean he, that he ain't going to get angry. He's great in power. He will not acquit the wicked. Listen, everybody, this is a saying, it's, it's not necessarily in the, in the Bible like this, but this is what it says here. Everybody gets theirs. You know that? Everybody gets theirs. Nobody gets away with anything. Nobody. Now, you know, those of us who put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, our judgment was placed on Christ at the cross, Calvary. Yet that was, you know, through faith in his blood, our sins are forgiven. But we really didn't get away with anything because many of us are bearing some of the consequences of stuff we've done. Let's just face it. In fact, just the fact that we get old is a consequence of sin. And not necessarily your own sins. Well, I'm getting, I'm, I sin, so I'm getting old. No, we just, we get old and die. Why? Because of sin. The wages of sin is death. We're saved by faith in the blood of Jesus Christ, but yet we still, unless if the Lord tarries and he doesn't come back, we're all going to be buried someday. We're all going to face that. You know, I was thinking we were blessed. God was merciful to us with, you know, the test came back negative on Rose, and we're thankful for that. But you know what? If it would have come back bad, God's still God. If we would have had to face that whole thing again, God's still God. He's still God. Okay? The rain falls on the just and the unjust. The wages of sin is death. We live in a fallen creation. Now listen to what he says. This goes on, and this describes God's character. This is the God that we serve. Just reading a little bit. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry and dries up all the rivers. Bashan languishes and uh, Carmel and the flower of Lebanon languishes. The mountains quake at him and the hills melt and the earth is burned at his presence. The world and all that dwell therein. Who can stand before his indignation? Man, I, have you ever... I, I've, I've, I always use this as an illustration for those of you that grew up in Arnold, Okay. I had a principal named Mr. Tannis. <laughs> if you heard on the, on the loudspeaker system your name and come, in, come to the principal's office immediately, man, that was like the last mile. That was, you did not want to stand in front of the indignation of Mr. Tannis. Okay? Now, that was just a guy. I don't want to stand in front of God's indi- I don't want I don't want to st- I don't want to be at that great white throne. I don't want to stand there. I don't want to face that. Cuz when God gets angry, this is his character. The earth is burned at his presence, the world and all the dwellers in who can stand before his indignation and who can abide the fierceness of his anger. This is the God we serve. Yes, it is. His fury is poured out like fire and the rocks are thrown down by him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows them that trust in him. But with an overrunning flood, he will make an utter end of the place thereof and darkness shall pursue his enemies. You better make sure you're on the right side. You better make sure you're on God's side. You better make sure that your faith is in him. I was talking today to, who was I talking to? Pastor Harold. Harold and I went out and had a little coffee. 
we're talking about everything that's passing for religious performance. There are, there are churches that are teaching people to be good without the cross. There's places that are teaching people to be good citizens, good people, without the cross. If it's not for the blood of Jesus Christ, I don't care how good you are. If you're not washed in the blood, he sees you as a sinner. I was, uh, I, put a, I put a thing on the YouTube about the, the, the commandment thing, you know. And I, I've, I've got some comments. And one guy, one guy or kid, I don't know who it was, he said, uh, he said, oh, you Christians, he says, all you want to do is, you want to be able to get away with breaking the law. You know, he started all this stuff. And uh, he said, yeah, he says, religion, he says, it's, and he went through this big, long thing. And uh, he said, I can be moral without the Ten Commandments. He said, you know, and I said, I don't know who this guy, I'm, like I said, it could be a kid, it could be an adult, I don't know. But we're teaching, we're trying to teach people how to be good. And you can maybe make your, you can try to be a good person. How many, have, if you witness to somebody and say, well, I'm a good person. Yeah. Everybody thinks they're a good person. And they might be good. But they're not good enough for God. They need the Lord. Okay? Abraham, if you were to ask the people who knew him, they probably said, well, he's a pretty good person. Pretty good guy. If you would have asked his neighbors in Ur of the Chaldees before, you know, they would say, what do you think of old Abram over there? He'd say, he's all right. You know, he's okay. But when he met up with God, he found out he was nothing. He had to believe God, and that was counted to him for righteousness. And then we're in the same place. What do you imagine against the Lord? He says in verse 9. He will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. When God does it, it's going to be done. He's talking about Nineveh. Something about the history of Nineveh, and, and without going into any great depths. If you read about Nineveh, the very beginning of the city goes back to about the same time as Babylon. <laughs> in fact, uh, if, if you read that, that part when it talks about Nimrod back in Genesis of the chapter 11, uh, maybe I have the wrong chapter, but it talks about Nimrod. He started Babylon, and it seems like he planted some other cities in that area also, or at least his offspring did. So it was an ancient city, and it became one of the most powerful cities. It actually was before Babylon rose to world power. Nineveh was like, they were like the guys. They were like the main thing. And as I said this before, when they would go conquer a country, they were mean, they were cruel. Nobody wanted to be conquered by the Ninevites, by the Assyrians, because they were mean. They were wicked. They were evil. They served other gods. In fact, we can read in, in, in the Old Testament, again, there was a king named Ahaz who, who met up with, with a, an Assyrian king, and he saw the, the temple of his God, and he said, man, I'd like to have one of them, and they built one like it just back in Jerusalem, you know. They worshipped other gods. It was, and they were a mighty city. But they were buried. They were buried. The remains of Nineveh weren't discovered until like the 1800s. In fact, a lot of people, a lot of detractors said, oh, the Bible isn't true because there was no place such as Nineveh. And the kings that are mentioned there from Nineveh, they said they didn't exist. But then they found the city of Nineveh, and they found writings and uh, you know, uh, rocks and, and stones with writings on them. They had the names of these kings that are in the Bible. He says, just reading a little bit here. He says, for while they be fold, folded together as thorns, and while they are drunken as drunkards, they shall be devoured as stubble fully dry. What Nahum is prophesying is the destruction of the city of Nineveh. Now, here's, here's what history tells us. The city of Nineveh, uh, uh, several years after Nahum and the Assyrian kingdom, they were besieged by the army from Babylon. It actually was a combination of the Babylonians and the Medes and the Persians. They came together. This was when Nebuchadnezzar was just in his ascendancy. Okay, And, and they, they surrounded the city of Nineveh. And what happened was there was a great flood. Uh, it was along the Tigris River. And there was a great flood. There was a lot of rains. And, and, and part of the flood, uh, this great flood washed away part of the wall that was around Nineveh. 
And the enemy could just come right in after the wall was destroyed. And they came in and they destroyed the place. Conquered it and destroyed it. And that's what happened. This was prophesied by Nahum. He prophesied something else. Look at verse 12. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, verse 11. Look at verse 11. There is one come out of thee that imagines evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. Thus says the Lord, though they be quiet, and likewise many, yet thus shall they be cut down when he shall pass through. Though I have afflicted thee, I will afflict thee no more. For now will I break his yoke from off thee and will burst thy bonds in sunder. Now, if you really want to understand, and we could read the rest of that chapter, but if you want to understand what that's about, you have to go to the book of 2 Kings, around chapters 18 and 19. And this was a prophecy that was given maybe 50 years before that happened. But in that time, there was a king named Hezekiah. How many have heard of the king Hezekiah? He was one of the good kings of Jerusalem. He was one of the great kings. And there's a story there that says when, when Hezekiah was, you know, the king, that the Assyrian army came against Jerusalem. This is when they were at their height, the Assyrians, Nineveh. They came against Jerusalem. There was a king there named Sennacherib, who was the king of Assyria at that time. Again, they found his name written, so this is, you know, attested to historically. And, and he, sent, he sent a fellow named... Uh, Rabshakeh, and I forget the other, there was a couple guys he sent with an army to Jerusalem. And what, what they would do, they would stand outside the wall of Jerusalem and they would yell in there, Hey, you think your God's going to deliver you? Just like the devil will stand and scream at you and say, Oh yeah, you think your God's going to heal you? You think your God's going to provide? And, and what they would do, they would stand outside the wall and scream and say, You might as well just give up. Because we're going we're gonna to surround you. We're going to besiege you. You're going to run out of food. You're going to run out of water. You're going to starve to death. You might as well just surrender now. And we'll take you. We'll, we'll take you somewhere else and get you established somewhere else. That's what this guy was yelling. And the, and the people, the leaders of, of Jerusalem, would stand on the wall and say, Hey, listen, don't talk in Hebrew. <laughs> and like, you know, speak to us in another language so the people can't hear it. But they were, it was like a morale thing. They wanted, to, they wanted to break their spirit by telling them lies. And if you would look at the circumstances, the Syrians, they conquered everybody they came in contact with. They were powerful. So old Hezekiah, if you read the story, and I'll just paraphrase it, but you can read it when you get a chance. He sent for Isaiah the prophet. He said, what are we going to do? I said, don't worry about it. They're going to be gone here in a little bit. And, and they heard, uh, the, the general there that had all those uh, soldiers, he heard that there was a battle going on somewhere else, so he left. And he sent a letter to Hezekiah. He said, Hezekiah? Listen, all these other people and their, their gods couldn't save them. You think your God's going to save you? He said, you know what? I'll give you horses if you want. Go ahead. I'm, I'll see if, you can, see if you can defeat us. And he wrote this letter. He said, this is what we're going to do to you and blah, blah, blah. So Hezekiah, you know the story. He took that letter and he took it to the temple and he laid it out. And he said, God, you see what he's, what he's saying here? God, you see, what he, you see what he's saying? Isaiah said, the prophet Isaiah sent word, and he said, don't worry. That night, the Lord smote 185,000 Assyrians. The hallelujah. Give the Lord a hand clap. That's all right. He smote, 100, he smote 185,000 Assyrians. They, they never had to shoot an arrow. And that was like the beginning. It, it wasn't long after that that Nineveh got buried, that the Assyrian Empire was broken. Okay. Now, reading just a little bit, and just chapter 2. This is just some historical stuff here. He says, <laughs> He that dashes in pieces has come up before thy face. Keep thy, the munition, watch the way, make thy loins strong, fortify thy power mightily. For the Lord has turned away the ex excellency of Jacob as the excellency of Israel, for the... Emptiers have emptied them out and marred their, their vine branches. God is saying, listen, I'm allowing the enemy to come against you to maybe get your attention. You know, sometimes God allows things to happen to get our attention. You, you know, and, and this is, and I'm just, I'm just being honest with you. These last couple weeks, while we were, you know, thinking about this, this uh, biopsy coming up. 
You know what? I, I didn't feel like watching TV that much. I, I was praying. I was reading the Word. God got me back doing what I should be doing. Not, I mean, I always read the Word, but not as much as I should, I guess. I know my wife had been praying. When you go through something like that, you know, you just get a whole lot more intimate with God, don't you? When, when, the, when the trouble comes, and when the, the threats come, and when, when you have that, you know what it's like to have that cloud over you. You ever been there? You've been there. You've all been there. And you don't know what the outcome's going to be? It seems that God allows those things to happen sometimes to get us more intimate with him, to get us closer to him. And it really kind of separates the men from the boys, the women from the girls. It separates those who really believe to those who are just in it because they like the music. It really, it really, it's, 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 uh, it says that God's word is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing the bone from the marrow, discerning the thoughts of the heart. Okay. Just reading on a little bit. Just drop down, and I'm not going to keep you much longer tonight, but look at, just, just look at uh, chapter 3. And, and you can read this all to yourself. I mean, for yourself, please, I encourage you to do it. <laughs> but listen to this. Woe to the bloody city. It is all full of lies and robbery. The prey departs not. This is a Assyria. This is Nineveh. The noise of a whip and the noise of the rattling of the wheels and of the prancing horses and of the jumping chariots. The horseman lifts up both the bright sword and the glittering spear and there is a multitude of slain and a great number of carcasses and there is none end of their corpses. They stumble upon their corpses. I read this stuff and it almost feels like I'm reading something in the Tribune Review. The great city of Nineveh. The powerful nation of Assyria. The thought they could never be defeated. The corpses are everywhere. The dead are everywhere. Shooting. You know, we hear it every day. It's almost like if a day that we don't hear about a shooting, it's like... <laughs> and it's like it everywhere. Any, any, major, any city you go to, you turn on TV, you know, if you travel, you turn on TV... Turn on the news. It's the same everywhere. In such and such section of town, somebody shot somebody. Said this. Just, let's read this a little bit. Because of the multitude of the whoredoms of the well-favored harlot. And when I read this chapter, I said, wow. If God did, did this to Nineveh, they had a revival. They had an outpouring of God's spirit. They got saved 150 years before this. Because of the multitude of the whoredoms of the well-favored harlot, the mistress of witchcrafts that sells nations through her whoredoms and families through her witchcraft. My goodness. We have a world market. Behold, I am against thee, says the Lord of hosts in verse 5, and I will discover your skirts upon your face. I will show the, the nations your nakedness and the kingdoms thy shame. In, am I, what is happening in the world today? We're being exposed. And I will cast abominable filth upon thee and make thee vile and will set thee as a gazing stock. And it shall come to pass that all they that look upon thee shall flee from thee and say, Nineveh is laid waste. Who will bemoan her? When shall I seek comforters for thee? Are you better than populous No, that was situated among the rivers that had the waters round about, uh, whose rampart was the sea and her wall was from the sea? Ethiopia and Egypt were her strength, and it was infinite. Uh, Put and Lubim were th thy helpers. Yet was she carried away. She went into captivity. Her young children also were dashed. I mean, listen, God's judgment is, is heading, it's, it's coming to every place that is wicked. Thou also shalt be drunk, and thou shalt be hid. Thou also shalt seek strength because of the enemy. 
All thy strongholds shall be like fig trees with the first ripe figs. If they be shaken, they shall even fall into the mouth of the eater. You know, if you ever go to a tree that has a lot of fruit on it and it's ripe and you shake it, just... it's coming. It's happening. It happened in Nineveh. This God is, is the same. Just reading a little bit more and we're going to close. There shall the fire devour thee. And this, this prophecy, by the way, came true to Nineveh. This was about 50 years before its destruction, and it, and it eventually came true. There shall, in verse 15, there shall fire devour thee, the sword shall cut thee off, it shall eat thee up like a canker worm. Make thyself many as a canker worm, make thyself to be as locust. You've multiplied your merchants above the stars of heaven. The canker worm spoils and flies away. Thy crown are as the locust, and thy captains as the great grasshoppers, which camp in the hedges in the cold day. But when the sun arises, they flee away, and their place is not known where they are. And look at this, verse 18. Your shepherds slumber. The shepherds are asleep. The pastors, the people who should be crying out, by and large, are asleep. Churches, and, and I'm not, listen, across the board, I'm not picking on one denomination or one group of people. It's just across the board. There are pastors that care more about getting the folks in the door than telling them the truth. Because, it's sad to say, if you tell the truth, there's some folks that's going to stop their ears. And they're going to go to the place that has the bigger party. The pastor, listen, I've said this before, and I went into it. I'm not going to get into it, but, you know, with this, with this Ten Commandment thing. They could smash that thing with a wrecking ball. And don't get me wrong. I want to see it there. I'm not, I'm not against it. But for all the good that's done at Valley High School, how many of them kids walk in the valley, look at that and say, well, yeah, Ten Commandments. We got to do that. They don't even know it's there. They don't care. I'm glad it's there. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not, I'm not being like that. But if it's not in the hearts of people, then it really doesn't matter. And, and I really believe this with all my heart. Not all. There's, there's great pastors. There's great churches. There's, there's great men of God on, in media that are preaching the truth and tell the truth and, and preach the word like it's supposed to be. But then there are people there are pastors, the shepherds. Jeremiah talked about it. He said, the shepherds have healed the wound of my people, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Everything's all right. Everything's all right. We'll elect a Republican. Everything will be fine. Everything will be okay. No. He says, your shepherds slumber, O king of Assyria, the nobles dwell in the dust. Your people is scattered upon the mountains, and no man gathers them. There is no healing of thy bruise. The wound is grievous. All that hear, the brood of thee, shall clap their hands over thee. And it ends there with that verse. Nahum does not contain any prophecies that go to the end time that we, you know, some of the prophets we say look beyond the time we're living in now. But he presents to us the character of a holy God who will not, he's long-suffering, but he won't tolerate sin forever. It's true for individuals. He'll put up with my nonsense, and he has. Thank God, thank God for his long-suffering. And some of you didn't get saved when you were five years old. I thank God he, he was long-suffering. He let me go long enough that I finally got to the point where I got tired of kicking. And I finally listened to him and believed in him. He's been merciful to our nation since the early 1600s, even before that. He's been merciful to our nation. 
He's been gracious to us. And I've said this, and I'm, I'm going to close with this. You were talking about, you know, all these monuments coming down and so forth. That's just, that's just in the last 40, 50 years. Up until that time, we had these religious symbolism everywhere. Nobody said nothing. City halls and courthouses and schools, Ten Commandments and everything else. And, uh, and, and nobody said anything about them. But why all of a sudden? You know why? Because we have, the, the, the believers in this country have let, have we turned our back. We've gotten lukewarm. And God said, okay, if you're not going to revere my holy stuff, I'll take it away. And that's what's happening. And I really believe, like, stuff is happening here. You know, pastors have gone down there. If, hey, if it brings some pastors together, and, and that's a good thing. If it brings it's Christians together to pray to God and worship God together, that's a good thing. Hopefully, the ones that really love the Lord, when they see this happening in our nation, they'll start getting on their knees and start to pray for our nation. Because that's what's happening. That's what's going on. Just like in Nineveh. And you know what? Now, I'll say this. I'm going to close. What happened in Nineveh? It's eventually going to happen here. It's eventually going to happen here. Unless there's some kind of big revival, a real revival and I believe there will be. I believe that God's going to move in these last days. I believe there's going to be an outpouring of his spirit. I believe there are people who are tired of all the, all the noise they're hearing. And they're going to, I believe there are folks that are really hungering and thirsting to get saved. I'm not talking about people who have been sitting in church for 60, 70 years and just been laying back and forth. I'm talking about folks out there on the street that are looking for something. You know, they're doing the dope thing, they're doing the women thing, they're doing the rap thing, they're doing all this, and they're going to find out if, if, they're, if they really are honest with themselves, they're going to get to the place and see the emptiness of all that stuff. And they're looking for something genuine and something sincere and something real. They're looking for what God has, the truth of the gospel, the blood of Jesus. It's something, you know, people might die for a righteous man, But Jesus Christ, when I hated him, he died for me. When he died for them folks out there that think Jesus is nothing but a swear word, he died for them. The love of God is, 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 is shown to them as it was shown to me, as it was shown to you. That's the message that the world and our nation needs to hear. I believe, I believe there'll be an outpouring of God's spirit. I believe there's, there's a revival coming in our nation. Because when people see how bankrupt everything really is, that's when they're going to call on the name of the Lord. And, and, and I want to be a bearer of good news. I want to tell the truth. I really don't care about providing, like, you know, a fun center. I don't care about, no, I'm not, no, I'm, I, I don't care about entertaining anybody. I don't care about, all I want to do is keep Jesus at the center of everything we do. These kids downstairs are lifting up the name of Jesus. I know what, uh, what Lynn and, and Kathy, they're, what they're, they're teaching them crafts. It's all about Christ. They're teaching them about Jesus and the cross and the blood. That's what it's all about. That's what it got to be. That's what it got to be. Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. Good to be in the Lord's house tonight.